So let's quickly run through a few of what we will call the conventions of fairy tales. Um, the pure distillation of plot, which means that it's brought back to the very bones. It's, it's always a boy walks through a forest and meets an old lady. The setting is anywhere and nowhere. It's one of the beautiful things about fairy tales is that they, they, they can be set anywhere. Uh, traditional sentences, archaic language, which I personally love, once upon a time, of, you know, those, the power of those words never, ever fade. Long, long ago, once, twice, thrice. An abstract style, a kind of universality of language, dark forest, brave youth, golden bird, rose wreath tower. Fairy tale numbers and patterns is something I'm actually very, very interested in, in the patterning of the stories, the underlying architecture of the stories and the repetition of, of certain numbers, particularly three and seven, but also nine and 13. These, these numbers appear again and again and again, and not only in the Western European fairy tale tradition, but in many other fairy tales as well. Um, magic and metamorphosis, these are stories of transformation. I think that's one of the key things about them. And so fairy tales are less about fairies than about magic, extraordinary magic in the ordinary world. Talking mirrors, the prince that gets turned into a frog, girls that, turn, that, that get turned into bears. Binary oppositions, the moral universe of fairy tales, good and bad, dark and light, rich and poor, beautiful and ugly, strong and weak. There's very little moral ambiguity in fairy tales, which leaves a lot of room for a creative artist to actually play and bring moral ambiguity into it. Memorable language. Um, as a storyteller, as someone who goes out and tells stories to a live audience, the way that we remember tales is all through the patterning of, 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 of images and symbol and all through the repetitions of sounds. I can tell a story that you know, will take an hour to tell and I will never forget a beat because it's all there in the language that you use. Rhythm and rhyme, repetition, the three hours of storytelling, alliteration, assonance, consonance, alliteration, all of... Um, Onomatopoeia, all of these poetic devices that used to help the bards and the storytellers and the troubadours remember their stories. This is what makes storytellers so memorable. And in mimetic theory, in the theory of what makes stories and things survive, it needs to be both relevant and memorable. And this is what helps make fairy tales so memorable. Um, we've got clear motifs, motifs and metaphors. What, what I would call, or what Ursula Le Guin called the language of the night. She said, fantasy, like poetry, speaks to the unconscious through the language of the unconscious, metaphor, symbol, and archetype. And I think that is a beautiful term, the language of the night, because I think this is how fairy tales talk to us, that they're not ever meant to be read literally. The princess is never a princess. A forest is never just a forest. It's a metaphor for something else. And because it's a metaphor, that gives it enormous um, depth of meaning. Whoever reads that tale, whoever hears that tale, brings their own individual experience to it. And so, you know, for them, you know, Rapunzel's tower, that tower could be an uh, image of a uh, loveless marriage. It could be uh, a job that is constricting them and keeping them from growing. It could be their life circumstances. It could be their own fear. The symbol of the tower can mean anything to anybody. And that's what gives it its universal power.